My name is Zach Weiss. For people who don't know me, I've had the great fortune to be able to really work around the world working for water. And so if you stick with us today, I'm going to teach you how to solve the problems of flood, drought, and fire. You're going to learn how to revive springs and rivers, turning desert into paradise. And I'm even going to cover how we can use these techniques to address climate change and extreme climate. So what we see around the world, something that really unites us right now is communities in crisis. Uh, recent you, I mean, there's too many to even mention. The amount of fire that's happening around the world right now, the floods that are happening around the world, all getting more intense and more common year after year. And so I was really lucky in 2012 to come across this project uh, with Sepp Holzer. And this was what we did over just 11 days. So we took this degraded landscape with, a wet, with an airstrip in the middle of the wetlands and turned it into this diverse interconnected ecosystem. And this really just blew my mind open and started this long apprenticeship with SEP over the following five years. And he's been such a huge foundational influence on me and what I'm able to do. And for those who don't know, check him out. We have a wonderful film about him. Uh, there's lots of good resources. The Kramaterhof is a wonderful example of how people can really steward their resources. And I got the ability to work directly with him one on one on different projects around the world in North America and Europe and really see how he was engaging in all of these different projects and activities. And it really left me with uh, this is one of my favorite quotes knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And it's not enough to just know how to solve the world's problems. We really need to actualize that knowledge and do it on the ground. And so this led me for the next uh, to present day work around the world, implementing this type of work for other people. And so really boots on the ground, hands in the soil, gaining the hands on experience, doing all of these different techniques and really using the best of traditional wisdom and indigenous knowledge and modern equipment and modern techniques and tools to get the best outcome for these people on their landscapes. And so I've been able to see a huge amount of the world. And as different as different parts of the world are, one of the things that surprised me the most is how similar a lot of the problems are. Whether you're in the cloud forest of Ecuador or the desert in Rajasthan or anywhere around the world, you're seeing a lot of the same issues. And I also want to normalize a different world view. We're used to seeing the world like this, when in actuality, at any given point, 50% of the world is covered with clouds. So we kind of have this false representation of what the earth is like and how foundational water is. And around the world, we can see signs of a full, healthy, functioning water cycle. You can see the vestiges of it. Even in the most degraded landscapes, you can see how there used to be something healthy there. And definitely check out, we have animations on this in a lot more detail, but really the way the water cycle functions is by naturally drawing in moisture from the coast, feeding it into biological systems that retranspire that moisture and create more and more of this pump of moisture from the oceans into the continents. But what we have instead is this watershed death spiral where it's all drained away as quickly as possible and this leads to all these different consequences from the flood that happens immediately to the drought that happens afterwards to the fire that happens after prolonged drought. And it's really shocking to see, you know, places, even tropical rainforests that historically don't really ever burn very rarely. Now, even these kind of places are being exposed to wildfire. Places are being exposed to torrential rains that haven't gotten it previously, extreme temperatures, extreme heat all these extremes rising. And so one of the big things I'd like to implore you to do is listen to your elders, talk to elders. If you learn from the elders, you will learn so much about the world, about the changes of the world, about the direction we need to go. And in some ways, you'll really be horrified by some of the things you hear. Listening to elders around the world, you hear stories time and time again from beautiful, pristine rivers that they could drink from to rivers that now go dry, that are so polluted they make their skin itch. You just hear time and time again how people used to drink from the springs and now those springs are gone and now they don't have water. 
used to hear about how the landscape was balanced. It wasn't too extreme in one direction or another. Now it's extreme flood, extreme drought, extreme fire. And so in this lived experience on the landscape, you can really learn all you need to know. And you can look back in time, this tree, Big Mama, was alive on Turtle Island, North America, before Columbus arrived. And when it was young, you could drink from any water in the continent any lake, river, stream, spring. And in really short order, we've totally changed this. And so we have a really bleak water future ahead of us. The direction we're headed is a really bad place. Currently, one, more than 1 billion people worldwide lack access to water, period. 4 billion people experience severe water scarcity for at least one month of the year. That's half of the Earth's population. By 2030, our annual global water requirements will exceed our sustainable water supplies by 40%. So we are overdrawing at such an extreme rate. And you see already approximately 40% of the lakes in the United States are too polluted for fishing, aquatic life, or swimming, let alone drinkable. And so this is in really short order. And now this one, I just find amazing. More than half of the world's wetlands have disappeared as if it's magic, as if one day, just all of a sudden, the wetlands disappeared, the climate change in the wetlands went away, when in reality, we have systematically removed, drained, destroyed the wetlands. They haven't disappeared, they have been destroyed. And so this is all something we can change. And there are amazing examples from all around the world, whether you're in Austria, India, Kenya, Borneo, Australia, they are amazing examples. These are just a few of the amazing people that have shown us what we can do, how to do it, and then it proves real-term results that provide for the communities living there. So whether it's Sepp Holzer in Austria, Rajendra Singh in India, Willie Smiths in Borneo, Wangari Mathai in Kenya, Zephaniah Fieri in Zimbabwe, or Peter Marshall in Australia. And there's just too many to put on a map. It would get way too messy. These are just some of my favorites. And so I had the fortune to learn from a lot of these people as well. Some of them are no longer with us, but a lot of them I've been able to meet and learn from. And Rajendra really showed me how community movements can create this immense change. And then continuing to go and learn from Sepp, he's always pushing me to the next level. Uh, this is a picture from a moment where he said some nice things about me, called me his best student, but immediately said, but one of you is not enough. We need hundreds, we need thousands, millions would be better of people working with water, working with nature around the world. And so this really got me thinking, how do I train up as many people around the world to be able to do this? I tried different ways, some more direct apprenticeship, and this eventually led me to water stories. Uh, which is really our way to share these techniques with the world. So we have this course all centered around training people to do this exact type of thing as a livelihood, whether as an advocate, a steward, or a professional, you too can create these kinds of changes. And we've created these stories that really help highlight, you know, these amazing examples of reviving rivers, of turning deserts into rainforest. And so at the community at Water Stories, you can find all of these full films and lots more information about these projects. And it's really warmed my heart to see how fast it's spread around the world. It really is something that clearly resonates with people because of how powerful it is. Uh, there's now people in 199 countries that have logged into Water Stories and multiple users in 171 countries. So really in short order, this type of information can spread around the world. So I made some pretty big statements at the beginning that I was going to teach you how to solve flood, drought, and fire, amongst other things. So let's start getting into it. When we look at flood, now rains come and some type of heavy rainfall and flooding cycles are natural, but the flood we're experiencing now is anything but natural. It really is the result of our drainage systems. And so uh, this project in Vermont just had a thousand year flooding event carnage all over the state, a state of emergency in a lot of the state, but this project has never been better. It was set up in a way to receive the rain, and not just that, but this project also helps equilibrate its impact on the landscape. So you can see this beautiful habitat, swimming pond, fish, 
in the pond. It's a really nice ecotone. We even are having blue herons come and it provides an immense amount of habitat. But more importantly, what it does is all of this hard surface, the buildings, the roads that creates all of this runoff that otherwise creates a flood downstream is now held onto this landscape and charged up into this landscape. So the landscape is healthier as a result, but also we've helped prevent flood downstream as a result. And if everyone were to do this, we could really quickly solve the current crises that we have with flood. What you see is it's a matter of how quickly that water moves through the landscape. So these are the same amounts of water, but experienced in a different flow through that landscape. When you have this concrete, hard, high runoff landscape with high temperature, low vegetative cover, all of that runoff happens all at once. So you get this spike in flow, the flood, then followed by the drought. If instead our landscapes are set up as sponges, where both the soil and the earth's body are set up to receive that rain, hold it and infiltrate, now you get a little bit of excess flow with the heavy rains, but you also have consistent long-term flow through the system. So this naturally leads us to the other side of that coin, drought. And the again, we're seeing all around the world, this is one of my favorite projects because of how simple it was. This is in Australia for a worm farmer. And just this one little water body saved this farm in the subsequent drought. We put in the water body. They had more water resources, which was great. But then they were followed by a really long two-year drought. Now, where all the farmers in the area were selling off their cows, were losing the farm in some cases, he was producing more than he ever had before because he had more water than he ever had before, not because it had rained, but because he had stored the water when it did rain. And so what we did here is create the one water body at the bottom, a network of terraces, a few smaller water bodies along the way, so that whenever that rain comes, it infiltrates, moves back and forth along those terraces, catches in the higher water bodies, infiltrates into the ground, and eventually feeds into that lower water body, which is then a reservoir for these really dry and extreme times. Another example of seps in Portugal, Tamara. This is a place that was really scarce on water, running out of water, and this is the landscape that they created there. Just by holding the water in the earth, they've really transformed this community from not having almost any water for agriculture to having plenty for agriculture, plenty for the community, and plenty for the ecosystem as well. But that's far from SEP's most impressive project. This one in Spain, the Extremadura, people thought it wasn't possible. They said it's too hot, it's too dry, there's not enough clay, all these different doubts and challenges. Yet there he created this beautiful site that's interconnected in 16 different water bodies. And whereas all the oaks were dying, now they're coming back. And this is the largest ecological zone of interest in Europe. Now, really important is these aren't like dams and reservoirs like engineers build. These are designed to return the water to the ground. So they don't just hold the water in the dam. They hold the water in the earth body above and surrounding it into that dam. So it infiltrates back into the landscape. This infiltration is what ends up resolving the drought. And so if you want to have a drought-free, flood-free landscape, you find places and ways to help that water enter into the earth. Another great example of this, Sepp's new farm, the Holzerhof. This was a farm that was sold because it was thought to be valueless. The farmer couldn't get a viable crop off of it. It was too dry, too hot. And here he created this landscape that 10 years later is just throwing food on the ground year round with very little care, very little maintenance, again, from holding and storing the seasonal water, both in the living systems growing within this, the agroforestry systems, and also in the terraces and water bodies that help hold that water when it comes. And so there you see trees just loaded, falling over with fruit, grown with no inputs, nothing except for the forces of nature and working with those. And so now fire, this is a big concern for people all over the place right now. And we see some really tragic examples just time and time again. And it really concerns me how quick we are to normalize fire. So this next one, there's no pictures for because all of the work that we did is 
what you might call pre-legal or not yet legal, which also speaks to how insane all of our regulations around land and water management are right now. But in Malibu with SEP, we did this project. We created a couple of water bodies. We created some terraces and we helped charge the landscape up with water. Now, what happened when the fires came through, the neighbors were all ashes, but this property was saved. This property didn't burn at all. And so the house was entirely saved by this work of water infiltration that we had done on the landscape. Now, not just that, when the rains came and then you get all the landslides from above, Again, the landslide came down the hill, would have smashed into the house, destroying it, but was again caught by this retention structure. And so it really saved the house twice, once from fire, once from landslide, yet everything that we did was skirting the rules, was bending the rules, because we really don't have the regulatory framework to allow people to make their landscapes water resilient, flood resilient, fire resilient, and really work with the water that they receive. So this example is a really shocking one, Peter Marshall in Australia. And Australia has a lot of wonderful examples, but to me, this is the most impressive of all the ones that I saw. There, they inherited this gold mine. And in Australia with the gold mining, they first dredged down to bedrock to drain all the landscape down. And when they're done mining the gold, they don't bother repairing that situation. So you have these huge erosion gullies. His family came from a lineage of gold miners and his father saw that this was wrong, saw how much disturbance they were creating on the landscape specifically related to water and started trying to figure out how to undo it, to reclaim these sites. And so Peter Marshall took over this property. There was one tree on it, a giant erosion gully, totally flood or drought and really no livelihood or anything productive there. And through time, holding the water on the landscape, feeding it in, growing the agroforestry systems, he has a beautiful forest farm there that they grow truffles, a very high value product grown in a natural way within the forest. But what's really impressive is that this landscape had fire swirling around it for two months, yet did not burn. It had fire coming in from all sides and they were able to really save this landscape because of the land management they had done. Because they had all these willows that are these very humid trees. When the fire comes, they drop their humidity, retarding the fire. Because they had all these water bodies because water doesn't burn. Because they had charged up the landscape with water so the vegetation was still humid, not dried out. And then additionally, they had managed the forest limbed it up and that enabled them to take these crown fires that were burning all through the crown of the tree and bring them down to ground level where they could put them out with a shovel and so this is a really amazing project where even a forest helps save itself from fire which when you think of conventional fire management we oftentimes think of removing forests creating defensible space but here the forest was part of what saved that property so now when we look at reviving springs and rivers, turning deserts into paradise, this is really a matter of all the same things, making landscapes that drain and making them retain the water instead. So when we have landscapes oftentimes have been dredged, drained, made to send the water through as quickly as possible, we wanna weave that water back and forth across that landscape, undoing some of that damage that has been done before. And so taking these dry fields that are pretty unproductive in their current state, recharging them with water and creating productive ecosystems as a result. And so here where we've done this in Oregon, we've taken one of their worst pastures and turned it into one of their better pastures that they can graze multiple times. An area that was always too wet because of these seasonal springs and then too dry now holds and builds up that water within the earth making it available through the drier times. And so again, through these terraces and water bodies, we're weaving the water back and forth across the landscape. Now here where we did a bigger project as part of the same project, we're actually storing water in this very dry hillside and circulating it to hyperize that infiltration, to really maximize how much water is infiltrating into this landscape. And here, in this valley, we have a spring tapped for drinking water and also around the way. 
And at the time that they were tapped, they were flowing at about the same amounts. Now, this one in the valley where we performed work, our test site has 20 times the flow rate of that one in the forest that's our control site. So we can really quickly bring water and life back to landscape, recharge springs, and even revive whole river systems. So when we look at reviving rivers, this really amounts to increasing recharge and decreasing discharge, putting more water into Earth's bank account than we're drawing back out. And you can see amazing examples of this in Rajasthan, the work of Rajendra Singh, the water man of India. Here, they're taking these communities, they're building small earthen dams in these seasonal waterways, holding that water in the landscape and changing the lives of these communities. This particular community went from nine hectares of agriculture to 650, producing four times the cost of that water body in the first year with their increase in productivity. And so here in this case, they're actually finding vertical fractured areas where the water will infiltrate more rapidly into the earth so that it builds up the groundwater within the earth that then comes back out in the dry season to those springs and rivers and waterways. And so by doing this time and time again throughout the same landscape, a lot of these small earthen dams along these rivers, recharging the groundwater back up, They've brought water to agriculture, they've brought water to wells and to people, but they've also actually revived the flow of those rivers, taking some rivers that were dry for long periods of time, one even a decade, and turning them back into rivers that perennially flow. And so this is a huge transformation where they've actually rejuvenated 13 rivers now in this area. They've brought water back to 250,000 wells. They've lifted the water table five meters in some areas, all with some of the least affluent people in the desert in the harshest conditions, just working with their volunteer labor. And so now when we look at some really big problems that we're facing, climate change and extreme climate, this really comes down to the flood, drought, fire cycle. I think so much of the problems we're facing today really come down to our land management and that we're creating this cycle of flood, drought, and fire. So how and why are these impacts important? What is black body radiation and what are these feedback loops? So when we look at what we've done to the landscape, we've taken it from the left side of the screen and moved it to the right side of the screen. And so Hopefully you now understand how that's created this flood and drought, but how it affects temperature and climate change is all of that concrete holds a lot of heat. And as its temperature increases, its ability to hold heat increases to the power of four of its temperature. So every degree that that concrete or that the earth heats up, it's able to hold many times more heat than it did previously. So this creates this feedback loop where as the earth gets warmer, its ability to get warmer increases and it gets hotter and hotter, much like a stove. The warmer the stove gets, the more energy the stove can actually hold and the hotter it can get as a result. Now on the left, you have this constant cooling of the vegetation, of water, of transpiration that I'll get into more. And so you can see how these two landscapes would be very different temperature wise. Even just looking at them, you know that if you walk through the one on the right, it's going to be hotter and more extreme. And on the left, it's going to be shaded and cooler. And we've done this around the world. And then we wonder why the temperatures are rising. And additionally, a lot of these concrete metropolises are in the bottoms of valleys in what used to be the fertile lands that were full of water and wetlands. And so we're draining not just the area of those concrete metropolises, but the whole area that feeds the water into that valley, all of that water is being drained as well. And so you see these city metropolises create these spikes in our hydrograph. They force all of the water to flow through all at once and then creating this long dry time as a result. And you're gonna see this graph a couple of times. It's a really important part. So now we have this drier landscape that's more able to hold heat, that's more exposed to heat, that doesn't have the natural cooling, that's getting warmer and warmer. Now you have these columns of high pressure heat domes rising, and this actually prevents the inflow of moist, humid air from the coast. 
And so you get this building up of pressure in the system till you get these huge storms rolling through huge periods of flood with long periods of drought in between. Now, all that water can't be absorbed by the landscape, crashes downstream, flooding people, destroying infrastructure. And then as the landscape dries out, you then have this perfect situation for fire because that water didn't go into the land and hydrate it. It went over the land and downhill. You have these tinder dry landscapes that are super susceptible to fire. And so you have this flood, drought, deluge, fire cycle that really is all of these extremes that we're experiencing around the world. So when we look at water versus carbon as it is revolved around climate change, it's really important to understand that more than two thirds of the heat dynamics of Earth are controlled by water. Less than one third is carbon. There's uh, some debate around how far on the scale those are, but we know a lot more of the heat dynamics on Earth have to do with water than carbon. And if you think about it and break it down, it makes a lot of sense. Water is much more present 2,000 to 50,000 parts per million versus 420 parts per million. So there's more of it in our atmosphere. It has five times the specific heat. So it has way more ability if it was the same quantity to control heat, but it has five times the ability to control heat, plus many times the quantity, depending on where you are. And then not just that, it has these phase changes that are hugely important. In these phase changes between solid, liquid, and vapor, there's a huge amount of energy absorbed or released. If you imagine the amount of heat required to take water from near freezing to near boiling, it's six times all of that heat just to go from liquid to vapor. So because water exists in all these three phases, it's very complicated, it's very hard to model. Even if you didn't factor in the phase change part of it, it has a lot more control of the temperatures and climate we experience, but then this phase change puts that effect into overdrive. And so we see this in places where they've done this work. In Rajasthan, they've experienced a two degree reduction in temperature. They've already reduced the temperatures that they experienced by two degrees as part of rehydrating the landscape, restoring the vegetation, changing the vegetative cover, and restoring the natural cooling. And now this was very much done through the empowerment and engagement of the communities. These communities did it themselves. They just provided the wisdom and oversight to move in the right direction. And so you can see they've already offset the anticipated warming from climate change in their own area just by working with water. And when we work with water, we see the results very quickly. I think that's why this is so powerful. You see the results after the first rainy season, the subsequent dry season, you see why your work was beneficial. And so we can also look at other projects like this. We have another film, Desert or Rainforest, uh, about the Canberra Botanical Gardens in Australia. Here, they created a rainforest in what was otherwise a dry sclerophyll forest. And I was there in the extreme heats and in the extreme fires of 2020. And even in those extreme temperatures, this forest was nice and cool. Now they store the water in a water body, they circulate it through a misting system, and they've created this immense amount of cover and shade in the forest. And so whereas the areas outside of the forest can easily be very hot, over 40 degrees uh, Celsius, um, which over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, in the forest itself, it's almost never above 25 degrees Celsius, a nice comfortable temperature. So you see a huge temperature difference depending on the water and the vegetation. And so when we look at rebalancing our climate, these are the tools that we have. Water has incredible cooling abilities. As it evaporates, it cools. As it moves between phases, it cools. And it absorbs and regulates the heat that we experience. Now, vegetation also has a huge cooling effect. When vegetation actually performs photosynthesis, it takes that water, converts it from a liquid to a gas, absorbing a huge amount of energy, it's then transported up higher into the atmosphere. And if that recondenses, it then releases that energy. So it's actually an energy pump moving heat energy from the surface of the earth up and radiating it out into space. 
And so water and vegetation are our best cooling functions. They're our best ability to cool. Now, something that really relates to both of these is the photosynthetic period. How long can a given landscape photosynthesize for? This is really important because as we get into more and more drought, where the water is flooding through and then we have a long dry season, our period of time that vegetation can photosynthesize is getting shorter and shorter. And so in some places we're going from 300 days of photosynthesis to 150 or 100. And so now we're not only creating more ability for the earth to hold heat, but we're destroying its very cooling mechanism. And so we really can understand how important the water and the vegetation is as far as balancing out our climate. And as that heat is released in the upper atmosphere, it's actually released at a wavelength that doesn't interact with other greenhouse gases. So this is a very direct way we can cool our environment, both locally and globally. Again, this graph really speaks to so much because when you have these spikes of flow coming through all at once, you have this very short period of time where there's enough humidity for photosynthesis. Now, not only are you collecting more heat, but you're not cooling. Whereas the opposite, in a landscape that receives, infiltrates, stores the water, you're photosynthesizing throughout the year. So yeah, temperatures are increasing, but your air conditioners are still going. And we really can experience that. You can go out on a landscape and feel the difference. Shade is not the only thing that a forest provides. It provides active cooling through its transpiration of water. And so you can go into a shaded area, take measurements of the temperature, and go into a forest, and you'll find a really significant difference, oftentimes 10 degrees or more. And so the solution to all these problems is really working with nature and the positive feedback loops that we have available to us. Water is the lifeblood of the earth. And as we bring more water into the earth, it creates this positive feedback loop that really helps us. So we humans can play an active role as the keystone species returning water to the earth. Where we have drained the water, we can retain the water. Then as a result, we'll naturally get more vegetation on that landscape, which then provides more cooling, more shade, more ability for infiltration. And as you have more infiltration happening, you now have more water available for the vegetation. And so it creates this flywheel where they each feed into each other. You get water feeding into the landscape, both from the soils and the forests and the waterways and the water bodies. And not just that, but trees actually produce the hygroscopic microorganisms that cause rain to nucleate into precipitation. And so you have this water vapor that on its own forms a heating blanket, but needs something to condense around to form a cloud and then fall as rain. Trees produce these bacteria that do this organization of water, create these ice crystals, rain droplets, and so you have this really important feedback loop where the forest is cooling, the forest is creating rain, the forest is creating infiltration. All of those are leading to more water going into the landscape, allowing more growth of the vegetation. And so we can really quickly recover areas when we work with this revived water cycle, when we work with these forces of nature. And so it's really our relationship with water and nature that needs to change. Over the last 10,000 years, we've desertified one third of Earth's land. Human activity has desertified one third of Earth's land, but we can very much undo that. And so this is a call for a new water paradigm for you each to go home on your landscapes and find the ways to make them retain the water instead of drain the water. And when we do this, we really create a viable future for ourselves, for life on this planet, for our co-living beings, for our communities, we can make health and prosperity around the world, no matter where we are. And so I hope that you'll join us at Water Stories, that you'll contribute, that you'll help understand, help others understand what's possible and how we can do it, how there's proven examples. We don't need new technology to solve a lot of these issues. We don't need new techniques even. We have them in existence. We have the proof of concept. We have the case studies. We just need more people doing it. 
And so that's exactly why we created Water Stories, to empower you all to make these kinds of transformations on your own.